Hi, this is Dixie. Um, I think when, when we have two microphones on, you get a lot of echo. So now that uh, Will has signed off, hopefully that's better. Um, somebody send a chat message if, if that's not the case, and we can work on that further. Okay, I'm seeing some betters. Good. Well, uh, once again, um, I'm Dixie Eklund. I'm the Associate Director of the Clinical Trial Statistical and Data Management Center in the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Iowa. Um, I also, my background is in nursing, but I've also been an IRB chair and an IRB member for over 20 years. So um, I thank uh, Will and the rest of the team for the invitation to talk to you. Um, he asked me to speak about ethical issues to consider in clinical trials in neuroscience. Um, I also come from the background that uh, University of Iowa serves as the data coordinating center for Neuronext, which uh, probably most of you are familiar with. And uh, because of that, um, we, we have worked on writing grants and applications and have um, for many, many different uh, studies. And we also have four funded studies. Um, and uh, the history of the Clinical Trials Statistical and Data Management Center here is also um, very heavily involved in the neurosciences. Um, we did the cost study, um, we did the TOAST study, um, as, and served as the data coordinating center here. And I know some of you, um, I can see who's joined in, um, are familiar with some of the people who've been involved there. But um, Bill Clark was uh, the original director here at the data center, and Chris Coffey is now. So, so uh, that um, is kind of the background. Um, I tried to think about how to give this presentation, and, and I felt like I had to. I know um, people are coming from different areas of expertise and experience. Um, but everyone's involved in uh, neurosciences in some way. So I thought I should probably start with just a little bit of the background on um, uh, uh, protection of human subjects in clinical trials, which is not a very um, sexy topi topic to talk about, but um, I think it, it helps to frame the discussion on what you need to consider when you are working with human subjects in uh, neuroscience clinical trials. So of course we start with um, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Cosmetic Act that was revised in 1938. Prior to that time, drugs could be um, given out. Um, that, that's the days of you know the traveling salesman on the wagon selling Coca-Cola that ended up to be you know heavily concentrated with um, co coca leaves, so cocaine in its components. Um, at that time, uh, the federal government decided that uh, we needed to require that drugs were proven safe before they were marketed, and uh, the the act was born at that time. Um, and then uh, that made the assumption that we needed to have clinical trials to move forward. Um, the history on the National Institutes of Health, which actually I didn't know a lot of this until I researched it a bit, but um, they traced their roots to 1887 with the Marine Hospital Service, which was um, for merchant seamen along the East Coast, um, there was a hospital service available, and this became the predecessor to what we know as the U.S. Public Health Service. Um, uh, within that, there, there was the Hygienic Laboratory, and in 1891, they moved that to the D.C. area, and then in 1930, uh, the Ransel Act changed the name of the Hygienic Lab to the National Institute, singular, there was only one at that time, National Institute of Health. Um, the institutes began to flourish. Um, uh, by 1937, we had the National Cancer Institute. In 1948, they changed the name to the National Institutes of Health. In 1950, that was the beginnings of the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, or NINDS, which um, we are heavily involved with in uh, the neuroscience clinical trials, of course. By 1970, there were 15 institutes. 
1998, Congress decided that they had to cap the amount of uh, institutes and centers that were through NIH, and so they capped that at 27. Um, in 2011, th there's been a little shifting over the years, um, but um, previously, National Center for Research Resources, uh, NCRR, was replaced by what's known as um, NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Science. And this is uh, the center that oversees the CTSA grants and, and um, is, in addition to NINDS, is um, also involved with a lot of the neuroscience clinical trials that we participate in. So we have to talk a little bit about the Nuremberg Code. Um, this is a, a video that um, um, uh, Alex Baldwin starred in, but um, most of you are probably familiar. Uh, after World War II, there was lots of discussions on the international level about um, uh, developing some criteria and code of ethics for, participate, for protection of human subjects in uh, clinical research trials. Um, the International Military Tribunal met and reviewed um, the experiments that had been done by the Nazi physicians on concentration camp uh, inmates. So from that, um, the Nuremberg trials, uh, they developed the Nuremberg Code, which uh, is that um, voluntary consent is absolutely essential, um, that the study should yield fruitful results for, for the good of society, that the results should justify conducting the study, and that the study should be conducted to avoid unnecessary physical or mental injury and no a priori reason to ever suspect death or injury. In addition, the risk should not exceed the importance of the question being answered, that the subjects should be protected from even the remotest possibility of injury, that the study should be conducted by qualified persons, the subject should be free to end participation in the study whenever they should so choose, and that a scientist must stop the participation of a study if it's likely that it could result in injury. So these principles have, have kind of guided everything that, that has come around um, since then for regulatory reasons, um, uh, papers, guidances, all those things are based on the original um, principles of the Nuremberg Code. So here's the first question. How many institute centers are there within the NIH? 25, 27, 32, or 35? There's a button here that says broadcast results, and maybe that makes it able for you to see that. Um, the answer is B, um, 27 institutes um, and centers is uh, what the congressional mandate has capped. Then I thought I'd talk a, a bit about some cases that have also historically shaped um, protection of human subjects and, um, and um, through that some of the um, guidances that we've come up with for um, uh, ethical issues in neuroscience clinical trials. Um, this is an excellent book if you haven't had an opportunity to read it. It was, uh, it was a bestseller in 2010, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. Um, uh, Henrietta Lacks was a black woman in uh, Baltimore who uh, developed uh, cervical cancer and went to Johns Hopkins and her treatment was of course they moved uh, the cancer and from the first living cell line was developed and these are known as HeLa cells and anybody who has worked in laboratories are, are very familiar with HeLa cells. They're used, um, bought and sold by billions across the country um, I've talked to people who actually thought they were called Helen Lane cells, um, didn't know that her real name was actually Henrietta Lacks. Um, this book was written by a reporter, um, I believe for the New York Times, I'm not remembering right now, but um, she actually met with the family and traced through the history of what had happened with Henrietta Lacks um, as she, um, because she was brought in repeatedly to have the, cell, the cells removed that then were developed into this living cell line. Um, there was never any informed consent. Um, there was no, you know, there was financial gain somewhere, but certainly not for the uh, Lax family. And um, that and that has been documented very well in this book. And it's an interesting read about, um, again, you know, it, it's the way the times were, and it's what's shaped how we think about uh, ethical issues in clinical trials now. 
I also want to talk a little bit about the Wilbrook hepatitis studies. Uh, the Wilbrook State School uh, was for mentally disabled children. It was op opened from the 30s until 1987 when it closed. In the 60s, um, the investigators there took the otherwise healthy children and um, inoculated them orally and with injection with hepatitis virus and then treated them with gamma globulin to see uh, if that would improve uh, the virus. Um, the parents were not told any of this. They were told that their children would be receiving vaccinations. And of course, we have to mention the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, in 1964, the 18th World Medical Assembly um, met and uh, developed the Declaration of Helsinki, which further added to uh, the principles of the Nuremberg Code and established 12 basic principles to guide physicians in conducting biomedical research. About that time also, in 1966, uh, physician Henry Beecher uh, wrote an article in the New England Journal of Medicine and uh, he was able to uh, write about 22 examples of pu published clinical research that placed subjects at risk without obtaining any consent. Um, and remember, it wasn't regulatory until this time that um, informed consent was, was sought from people for protection of human subjects. Um, he pointed out that uh, there was competition for funding and that recognition might contribute to the problem of putting subjects at risk. And he recommended evaluation for compliance to the ethical standards prior to publication which is the norm now for all peer-reviewed uh, scientific journals. 1966, we also saw the establishment of OPRR, um, Office for Protection of Research Risks. Um, this was um, through the Department of Human Health and Services, and they developed the policies for protection of human subjects. So at this point, it's still policies. Uh, they're not regulations. And this is, was the start of the guidance for establishment of uh, institutional review boards. And most people are familiar with the Tuskegee study. Um, this study was initiated in 1932, planned to go on for about six to eight months. They enrolled um, Negro males in the Tuskegee, Alabama area. Um, this movie is called Miss Evers Boys. Miss Evers was a nurse uh, who lived in the community and actually thought she was helping uh, to work with, with these individuals. Um, they did long-term follow-up, kept renewing. Um, it must have been a record for no cost extensions or, or refundings. And then, um, and this was all conducted through public health service. But uh, probably the biggest issue was penicillin became available as a treatment in the 1950s, and subjects were um, this was not they were not told this, and it was not made available to them. Um, in the 90s, um, uh, this came out in an article in the 70s, but in the 90s, uh, President Clinton at the time uh, had a formal recognition and apology uh, to those living and uh, surviving family members um, to recognize uh, that this wrong had been, had been done. In 1974 is when uh, we were introduced to the National Research Act. Um, this is when the, the policies for protection of human subjects now became the regulations. Uh, so this was establishment of the Code of Federal Regulations, CFR, which uh, you'll hear people talk about as far as um, regulations for protection of human subjects. This is also the establishment of the National Commission for Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. That commission met over four years and uh, at the Belmont Hotel in Washington, D.C., and they developed the Belmont Report. We talked about with the Nuremberg Code how these things would, uh, would grow out of, out of previous uh, documents and discussions that had occurred. But it became a, a guiding principle to respect for persons to recommend uh, or to recognize personal dignity and autonomy of every subject who participates. Um, there's special protection for those with diminished autonomy. So that's uh, where we start to think about people with neurological disorder, um, um, impaired decision making, cognitive impairment, those kinds of things. And there was description from uh, that the informed consent uh, documents needed to contain information that was understandable to the subjects. Um, that's when they introduced the concept of uh, the reasonable volunteer standard, so that a reasonable volunteer could read and hear the information that's presented and understand uh, what they were being asked to do and participate in. Um, they also included the concept of comprehension and voluntariness. 
The second guiding principle of the Belmont Report is beneficence. Um, this is an obligation for researchers and investigators to protect the persons from harm, um, to maximize any anticipated benefit minim and minimize the possible harm. And this leads to what IRBs consider as the risk-benefit ratio. So the risk needs to be described, what they are to the subject who participates, and then what the probability and magnitude of those risks are. Um, typically, IRBs will sort those out by um, severe risks, um, um, minor risks, minimal risk, um, frequency, you know, more than 1%, more than 10%, um, happens commonly, uh, happens infrequently, um, so that the subject gets a good understanding of what potential problems they could encounter while they participate in a research project. And then also they need to uh, describe the benefit uh, to, to the subject and to society. The third principle of the Belmont Report is uh, justice. And this implies uh, that there needs to be fair distribution of the research benefits and burdens. Um, this uh, was where they further developed the concept that you include or exclude uh, persons based on a scientific basis rather than convenience or availability. Um, you saw from the Willowbrook uh, example that those children were included in that research project simply because they were a convenient sample that could be reached and accessed. Um, the, the, this was the development of stricter inclusion-exclusion criteria and making um, the, the, the research projects available to all uh, on a scientific basis, and uh, which would protect uh, the autonomy of subjects and also lead to more better generalization generalizability of the results. Um, it also talks about two levels of justice, um, social justice, which means, you know, to the community at large, and then individual justice. So just so you can see the numbers and uh, know that uh, they were included as part of this discussion, in 1981 uh, was development of 45 part, uh, CFR Part 46. In 83, that was re revised to um, incorporate uh, special classes of subjects. But then in 1991, the federal government um, determined that uh, it, it was going to be beneficial to codify across the 15 different federal departments and agencies that were involved in human subjects research. And um, uh, these were all codified commonly, to, which is what is known as the common rule. Okay, here's a question. Uh, which of the following is not one of the founding principles of the Belmont Report? A is respect for persons, B is scientific integrity, C is beneficence, and D is justice. Just broadcast the result, and uh, you, are, you are all nearly 100% seeing that scientific integrity is not one of uh, the founding principles. So a little bit about GCP, good clinical practices. Um, this is a term that you hear thrown about pretty heavily <laughs> if you're in the, uh, the clinical research world. Um, it goes to, actually I use that as a question for anybody I interview here, and it's kind of amazing how many people don't really know what GCP is. Um, this was developed by the International Conference on Harmonization. Um, this was an attempt in uh, 1996 to develop international studies because many, many multicenter clinical trials are, you know, are certainly not just conducted in the U.S. There's lots of activity in Europe and also China and Australia and uh, different areas of the world. So, so they tried to come up with a harmonization so that people are uh, typically um, uh, following the same sets of standards and practices. And basically this just addresses, um, there, there are best practices for all these things, you know, ways to get consent, ways to conduct a protocol, ways to organize a site, ways for investigators to be qualified. Um, all those things are laid out in there and uh, people use that pretty much as their Bible, I would say. Um, I also thought I should talk a little bit about some of the things that happened in uh, what I call kind of the dark ages. Um, I've been involved in clinical trials for um, almost 30 years now. And so from the start when there was very little activity and, um, and there were, there were um, you know, lots of uh, like descriptive studies going on, some of the cancer studies got going, 
Um, but as, you know, as the country grew and as funding grew, there became lots and lots more um, clinical trials that people were able to um, develop, get funding for, and uh, people were able to participate in. And then things, you know, it's almost like uh, things got a little bit ahead of themselves. So um, in uh, the 90s, uh, the country went through quite a bit of time where um, things were happening that needed to get um, uh, evaluated and we needed to find out better ways to protect human subjects. Uh, one of those cases was Nicole Wan at the University of Rochester. She was a 19-year-old student who participated as a healthy volunteer in a bron bronchoscopy research protocol where um, volunteers would have a bronchoalveolar lavage to harvest cells for lab work, typically. Um, she underwent the procedure, which is you know a common clinical procedure done hundreds of times a day in many institutions. Um, she must have probably had a pretty strong gag reflex, and subsequently she was administered um, up to four times the amount of recommended lidocaine for that procedure. Um, she developed an acute lidocaine toxicity and died on March 31st, 1996. Um, and the investigation revealed that uh, investigators had failed to follow the protocol and they had failed to properly inform of the risk of uh, lidocaine toxicity that could occur. We also have uh, the Jesse Gelsinger story from the University of Pennsylvania. This was an 18-year-old boy who had a OCT deficiency, a metabolic disorder that could be controlled with low-protein diet and drugs, um, but the investigators at the time had developed a gene therapy protocol where you could infuse um, corrective genes um, transported by an adenovirus. Um, Jesse Gelsinger was administered this pro product and within 24 hours had multiple organ system failure and died September 17th, 1999. Um, and in the review of that particular project, it was found that he was, uh, he was actually ineligible um, on some of the criteria. Um, the investigators had failed to follow the protocol um, as it was written and had been approved by the FDA and it resulted in those investigators being sanctioned. And also about that time we had uh, Ellen Roche at Johns Hopkins University. She was a healthy 24-year-old um, participating in an asthma study uh, where uh, the, there was an inhalation of hexamethonium. Hexamethonium was an anesthetic agent, I believe, from the 50s that had actually been um, disproved by the FDA, but it was still available for certain uh, laboratory experiments. Um, uh, she inhaled this product, became ill within 24 hours, and died of respiratory and renal failure one month after the study. Uh, her compensation for participating was $365. Um, it was found that uh, the investigators uh, failed to disclose the experimental nature of the research, and they hadn't properly researched um, the, um, the known risks of hexamethonium that ha had existed in the literature previously. So what happened? The U.S. government halted research. Um, it, it was pretty dramatic at the time. Um, in May 1990, human subjects research halted at Duke. July 2000, halted at University of Oklahoma. November 2000, um, University of Colorado. So it was uh, across the country. There were more institutions, but um, this kind of was all happening uh, on top of each other. And those of us who were involved at the time um, were looking pretty closely at what our procedures were. And, and how we were administering uh, human subjects protection and, and participation in clinical trials. Um, this resulted in uh, the establishment of the Office for Human Research Protections, OHRP. Um, this became, there was obviously doing investigations of different institutions and in their human subject protection programs. In 2000, they issued 78 determination letters, which um, were, you know, revealing about different centers of uh, findings that they had that they, of lack of compliance or areas of improvement. 